everyone. Thank you for joining us today on Creating a Culture that Drives Success. My name is Tanya Devane, and I'm a client advisor here with the Omnia Group. Let's get started with a quick poll in regards to creating that culture that drives success. So if everybody wants to kind of type in what type of culture motivates you. And then also you can answer our poll questions. The first one is every employee in the company can um, can describe our culture to a new employee, yes or no. Okay, I see Kim typing. Perfect. Okay, I have some mixed 33, 20. Okay, I see the numbers going in all different directions. Some people feel yes, no, maybe in regards to being able to, uh, if employees can describe the culture to new employees. And then what about this other one? Culture can vary from department to department. I have true, 100%. Kim, team-oriented. Sarah, when the workplace is like a small family. I like that. I like that, Sarah. So when we talk about culture, the first thing, oh, we, um, excuse me, I see some people joining us. So I'll go ahead and give you all a chance to kind of answer the, uh, the poll questions. We're talking about what drives you, what motivates you. So when you're thinking about the culture that motivates you, you can go ahead and type that in. And then also think about, you know, if, if I think about my culture and I think about the employees that I have on staff and I'm bringing someone new in, could my existing team describe to that new employee what our company culture is? And then think about it, not only as a company, do you think that different departments have different cultures? So true or false? So I'm going to go ahead and end the polls. So it looks like 50% of the people on today think that no, every employee cannot describe, um, excuse me, they think no, that every every employee can describe our culture to a new employee. And, and that's what we see a lot in the industry where people, you know, culture sometimes can be hard to find. You kind of know it and you know when there's a good one and you kind of know when there's a, a bad one. But when you reach that middle ground where this kind of like, eh, it's all right, that's when it gets a little harder to define. But we definitely want to move towards that good, positive, motivating type of culture. And then when we look at our second poll question that talks about culture can vary from department to department, and you all are spot on. Yes, you know, think about your sales team. Your sales team's culture is going to be completely different than your service team because that sales team is more of that competitive um, type of culture where your service team is going to be more of that service oriented, hence the service team name. So, the, so while you may have one culture overall, you have a company vision, core values, but once you break it down into different departments, that culture can, and can differ. But the thing about that culture in each department, it still is going to go back to the core values. Your service team still wants to assist your customers. Your sales team still wants to assist your customers or potential customers. They're just doing it in different ways. So when we talk about culture, the first thing we want to do is we want to define it. We want to, you know, what, what does culture mean? So the dictionary basically tells us that culture is the personality and character of your organization. So now let's talk about this a little bit. When we're talking about your personality, the character, it's basically your brand. So what, what goes into play in regards to that is, one, how are decisions made? So that talks about, that builds that brand on your culture. So you want to know, is it from the top down? Do you have a collaborative? Is there a consortium? Is there a think tank? Is it just the CEO or the president that is making all the decisions? So that builds into your culture. The next piece is, are decisions communicated to the employees? Is it a closed door where you, know, you don't find out till a client tells you about it? Or is it an open door policy where, every, where everybody knows everything? It's a very transparent type of culture. The next piece is, do you, do you give kudos? Are there recognition um, that happens throughout the year? 
that also adds into what type of culture that you have. And I see Trina said yes and Julie said yes. Perfect. And then the next one is interaction among, oh, I'm sorry, y'all were saying that you all can hear me. I, under, I see that now, sorry. Um, and then the next one we talk about is interaction among the departments. Are, is your office siloed where, you know, the sales team just stays with the sales team, the, the service team just stays with the service team, accounting, they have their own little piece, and no one really talks to each other. Just everyone is doing their own thing. They come in, they close their door, they do their work, they do their work, and then they go home. So that talks about your culture as well. So that's also building your brand depending on what type of, um, you know, how your departments intermingle or if they do mingle at all. And the last thing that kind of builds that culture brand is interaction among top management. Does management just come in, close their door, you never see them, hear from them, you, you know, you don't even know if Bob the CEO is in or if Jane the CFO is in. It's just I'm coming in doing my job and, and I'm going home. So all of these things build your brand. They, they talk about um, your culture. And so when we're, now we're getting ready to break this down into four different types of culture. So when we're looking at the different types of culture, um, culture can affect every aspect of your company. And that's you know from the public's perception of your brand to your employee satisfaction and basically to the bottom line. Because we all know if we have happy employees, we have happy customers which means if we have happy customers, I get more, you know, there's more revenue coming in. Because there's so much at, at stake, it is very important that your company culture is, is adaptable and open to improvement. And that starts from articulating just what kind of culture your company has. And really, there's no two cultures alike. When I go through these, you may say, oh, that, that sounds a little bit like us. No, I, we're a little bit more of the other one. You may have a combination. So let's talk about the different types of cultures. We have a team-centric culture. We have an influential culture, a co-op culture, and then we have a conventional culture. Excuse me, culture. Often the industry of a company will dictate its culture to some degree, but that doesn't mean that your culture can't change. If you're a startup, it can move from you know being a co-op, move into a more team-centric, or move into a more influential. While no culture is best or worst of the bunch, each has its pros and cons, and we're actually going to go through the pros and cons of each culture. So let's go ahead and start with team-centric. So the characteristics of a team-centric uh, culture is, one, there's no silos. Team-oriented companies hire for culture first and skills and experience second. A company with this type of culture makes employees, their happiness is their top priority. And as you can see, we have Zappos down at the bottom. You know, with this type of culture, you might have frequent team outings, uh, opportunities to prove, uh, to provide meaningful feedback, and flexibility to kind of accommodate a family and friends. So you have that work-life balance. Other characteristics are, you know, the happy hours that, that may happen. You may have, um, your team may regularly socialize outside of work. That's a, a component of having a team-centric type of culture. You also receive thoughtful feedback from employees in surveys. So peer-to-peer -peer surveys, I remember I worked for a company where we would have a board that would call peer review. And it was just your peer seeing you doing something well. They would write you a kudos note, and we would stick it on the board. And at the end of the quarter, all the cards would go into a hat, and we would pull a few of them out, and people would get prizes. And so peer-to-peer -to -peer to review are very important and sometimes that's more meaningful than actual your manager reviewing you because your peers are in the trenches with you. They know they know what's going on. They know, you know, the fires that we're having to put out on the front lines. So that peer to peer review is is very nice and sometimes you might hear it as a three sixty, meaning that everybody is 
reviewing everybody basically. And then the last piece is people take pride in their workstations, you know, decorating their desks and, you know, putting special things out. You, when you walk in, like your chest is sticking out a little bit further because you're proud to work for that organization. That's typically what a team-centric type of culture is. But like I stated earlier, there are some things, uh, you know, some, some have their strengths and some have their challenges. So now let's talk about the possible pitfalls that may happen. The first pitfall is as the company continues to grow, this can sometimes be a little bit harder to maintain. Zappos is a large company and they've worked very hard at maintaining that team-centric type, uh, type of culture, but it can be difficult. So that can be a challenge if the team is getting very large because you can imagine, you know, probably Zappos isn't having, you know, uh, the whole company maybe aren't going to happy hours, but the departments are going to happy hours, teams are going to happy hours because the core value is that team piece. So we just have to break it out into departments. And the next one is employee conflict because, once again, when you start socializing outside of work and having those happy hours, then we start getting into people's personal lives just because now we're spending more time together and now we're talking outside of work and we all know that can sometimes breed breed some conflict. So that's also a challenge when you have a team centric type of culture. But knowing these challenges ahead of time can help you in regards to how, how can we handle conflict? And here at the Omnia Group, we've done a couple of webinars on that as well in regards to hand, uh, conflict resolution. And the last challenge is consistency. While, you know, having this team-centric type of culture, as the company grows, sometimes it's going to be a little bit harder to be consistent because it's getting larger. So the things that we used to do, maybe we can't do. So you may have to tweak them a little bit. So it doesn't look the same, but it feels the same. So when you're thinking about your culture, think about the positives, but also think about the challenges. And if we can be proactive in thinking about how, you know, how this culture may be a challenge for us, then you'll have a better culture because now you've already kind of resolved the issues that could possibly come up. The next one that we have is influential culture. And I know when I talk about the influential culture, people are probably like, well, that's Apple. I decided to talk about SpaceX um, because we all know about Apple and Google and, and the great things that they're doing. And they're also part of this influential culture. SpaceX are the people that are now putting up rockets. A couple, you know, you might hear them in the news. They, they've had a couple of, a couple of non-successful missions, but they, but they keep trying. And that's part of the characteristic of a influential culture. Companies with this culture are often out to change the world by untested means. And that's exactly what SpaceX is doing. Yes, NASA used to put up rockets, but now this is a private company doing it. They don't have the big government, you know, backing them. An influential culture hires only the best because it's always pushing the envelope and needs employees that aren't merely just trying to keep up with the status quo. They want to think outside of the box, innovation and sometimes daring. These companies are usually partnered with other companies that need them to grow. So think of Apple. You know, we need, you know, I know I have my iPhone. <laughs> And I know I need my iPhone to continue my life because I, if I don't have my iPhone, I feel like I have been cut off from the world. So these companies, the influential companies with that influential culture, businesses rely on them to push them to the next level. So the characteristics is one, the, they question the status quo. Whatever the norm is, they want to do something above that. Employees at the with an influential culture aren't afraid to question things that could be improved. The next characteristic is that employees make work their top priority, often, often working long hours. I know we've all heard about Apple and Steve Jobs and how hard people work there and the hours that they work. 
but because it's uh, such innovative type of work, that is what's driving them. So while it's long hours, it's motivating hours because I know I'm doing something big and amazing. The next piece is your top talent moves up the ranks quickly because you know because I'm doing great things, great things are being seen, and so the people that are doing it will move up quickly. And then your last one is you may have a lot of highly qualified job applicants so that your applicant pool is usually very large because everybody wants to work for this company that is making things happen. I mean the world would, would cease to exist if some of these influential companies stopped producing. Just imagine if Apple stopped, if Google stopped, you know, for some reason. Things would come kind of come to a screeching halt. So that is what people are feeling. That's what the brand is. And so that's why people want to work for those companies. And the challenges that you have is highly stress. I mean, if I'm working 80, 90 hours a week, that's a highly stressed environment. While it's a, it could be a good stress, it's still stress. And we all know stress on the body is not good. The next pitfall is because you know, I'm trying to be the first, the best, the quickest, you might have some conflict because I want to beat you. And sometimes with influential uh, cultures, sharing is not always top priority between team members because I want to be the one that reveals that I came up with the new, you know, the new piece of the phone or the new way that people can search and things like that. So sometimes that can breed resentment because if I feel like you're keeping, you know, think about if the team doesn't feel like they can trust each other, that that can be a problematic team. And some of the ideas may be stifled. And lastly, you worry about burnout because, you know, you can only push so hard so fast for so long before things start to fall through the cracks, before you start to not having the new greatest idea because your brain needs a break. You know, every every muscle in your body needs to take a break sometime. And if you're pushing it too hard, you're going to get burned out. But once again, understanding what these challenges are is very beneficial in regards to creating the culture. And you think about your product, your service. Is this the culture that we want? Is this the culture that we desire? The next culture that we have is the co-op culture, or could be called collaborative. You know, this is where titles don't mean much in the co-op culture. Co-op culture is, is common among startups, excuse me, because it makes for great collaboration. It makes a great uh, collaboration type of mindset, type of think tank, everyone pitching in. They, uh, this is a, typically a younger company. Um, they typically have a product that is more tech, more more on the tech side, or more on the service side um, that provides for flexibility and change. And and because they are a smaller company, a startup, they can kind of read or change or make changes. Excuse me, based on the market research and customer feedback because they're smaller. When you have a co-op culture. Teammates discuss new products, ideas in the break room. So it's informal think tank section, uh, sessions. Excuse me. You know, you may have a room where you everyone goes, and you know, whenever you have an idea, just go into the room and write it out. Um, you you know, you may have areas in the office that are meant for calm thinking, or you may have areas in the office where a lot of people can go together. I know when I was reading and doing research about the culture and things like that, um, about this webinar, excuse me, people talked about, I was reading that some people need to have silent moments and that's when they can be their most creative, where other people need to have other people around them so they can kind of bounce ideas off and once somebody says something, that will spark their ideas. So co-ops typically have an environment that suits both. You know, we have the individual areas where you can kind of, you know, have your kumbaya and solace moments and yoga moments 
in that one area, and then you have the other areas where it's a lot of interaction, a lot of people. So think about, you know, your culture and do you have those informal think think tank sessions or is everything scheduled on Outlook, there's a meeting, you know, at 5 o'clock and this is what we're going to discuss. The next uh, thing, uh, excuse me, the next trait is everybody does a little bit of everything. So there's relaxed job titles. Um, you know, just because you're the CEO doesn't mean that you can't go make the coffee because we all have to pitch in. Um, and then the last, or excuse me, the next one is every idea is equal, meaning that just because I am the CEO doesn't mean that my idea trumps the account manager. We're all in this together. So my idea is just as important as everyone else's idea, and no one, no one idea leads, uh, leads the pack. And then collaboration is the key. That is the most important piece, that everyone is, is coming together, that we think that there is not one piece of the puzzle that's bigger than everyone else. And that's what Basecamp 3, they are a, they're still acting like a startup. They've actually been in business for 19 years. And what they do is they uh, build websites, basically, and or they help your website work uh, more efficiently. Like some of their clients are um, Panera Bread, like when you're doing their online ordering. They are the ones that help Panera Bread make that ordering process easier. But they're only about 37 people, and but they have uh, 23, um, excuse me, 23 of the top 100, Fortune 100 companies as clients, but they're 37 people. And the 37 people don't really work in the office. Some work in the office and some of them work remotely because they don't want to stifle that creativity. But they have, um, they call them iView sessions, meaning that they will all get together on basically like a Skype session, and that's how they have those meetings. That's how they have the think tanks. They also have uh, smart chats on their computer. So if you have an idea, you can just quickly send it out to someone to kind of bounce the idea off of them. The challenge for that type of company is the direction, especially as an employee. Because you're kind of out there remotely on your own, um, not really having a clear direction of how to move up, because everybody it's because there's no titles, you know, so so there's not always a clear indication of what's the next move or, or what's my next step in the career path. And it lacks culpability because if no one has a title, no one is necessarily having responsibility, then who do we blame? You know, who do we go to? So some of that with that co-op, when you don't have harder lines, it, you can have some of this. And lastly, the path, the career path is unclear, once again, because of the lack of direction in regards to where we're moving. The last uh, culture that we're going to talk about in depth is the conventional culture. And think about the uh, GE. GE recently, just recently, is now launching their new commercials about, I know the commercial when the guy is talking uh, his father says, pick up the sledgehammer, pick up, and, and he was like, I got a new job at GE. And they're thinking, GE is, you know, GE does light bulb. They're not thinking about the, the innovation that GE is doing right now. And, um, and so GE is actually, it's, it's a conventional company now, but it is transitioning into um, a more, influ they're trying to transition into a more influential uh, type of culture. Today, the conventional companies still have a clear, defined hierarchy, yet many of them, like GE, are grappling with learning, with learning curve of communication through new mediums, through technology. They're facing the challenge, um, can be a big opportunity for them to really re reinvent themselves, reinvent their brand. When you're in a conventional culture, departments are separated. There are silos. Um, this clearly defined. The uh, there are strict guidelines for more. Excuse me, for most departments and roles, people in different departments generally don't interact because the positions are well defined. You are sales. You are service. You are accounting. 
you are admin and we don't necessarily need to talk to each other. Major decisions are typically left uh, to a single decision maker or just C-level C um, level management. So it's, it's not a cooperative, it's not a let's get together type of, um, type of culture. And then lastly, and they have stringent protocols. You know, we, we don't want to deviate. This is the way it is. They see things in black and white. The challenge, obviously, of, of that type of organization is it lacks innovation. I mean, you know, if we're going to stick to these protocols, which is good, I mean, you know, it's, it's nice to have ways of doing things, but we don't want to be so inflexible that we break. We want to be able to bend. And then the next one is little motivation. You know, if I know every day how my day is going to look, exactly what we're going to do, I can do it with my eyes closed, your motivation is not going to be there. And then that's also going to affect your engagement scores. How engaged can I feel if I'm going to do the exact same thing the exact same way each and every day and I have no say so in regards to you know how it's going to be done, how it's going to look and I'm the one on the front lines actually doing it and so I think that's why GE is now revamping trying to put put out in the market that they are this new innovative company and that they don't just do light bulbs anymore. So now we've went through four character, uh, excuse me, four cultures. Which one do you think that you are? I'm going to bring my poll over. So which culture would you like to work in? The team centric. So think of uh, Zappos, think of Amazon uh, for your team centric. Uh, influential, think of Apple. Uh, think of Google for your co-op. Think of um, startup companies, new tech companies at the very beginning where you're getting in on the ground floor. Or think about maybe a conventional where, you know, the, the lines are there. You kind of know what it looks like, the hierarchy. You know, it, it's a well-established company. You have stability because it's not one of these co-ops where it's just a startup or an influential that keeps trying to do new things and if the new things aren't taking off then what's going to happen with that influential culture or, or would you like to have a combination of all three of them or maybe two of them so I see you know so it's, it's going it's kind of even across the board except nobody wants the startup nobody wants the techie company <laughs> everybody um, either wants the team centric the influential or the conventional and that and that's great you know the, the co-op is is a, a riskier one just because it is the startup there they don't have as much um, direction because they haven't been established as long so now when, we t when we're thinking about the different types of cultures that we went through, now let's talk about, and you know, now we see the culture that you're looking for or that you would like to work in. Let's talk about your actual culture and how do we determine what your actual culture looks like. And when we do that, we're, you know, we want to do a cultural survey basically. So you want to ask. You want to ask your employees, and the benefit of employee surveys is, one, you can learn working conditions. You can learn about the pay benefits, you know, are people enjoying the pay, the benefits. You'll also find out about the lines of communication, which and all of this goes into your type of culture. The next one, um, when we're talking about finding out about your culture, is one, doing town hall meetings. And yes, you can have them in that open forum. Um, you want to be prepared for the unknown. But also with the benefit of doing a town hall, it provides information and allows, um, and allows you to answer questions. It helps employees feel like they're in the know. If a CEO, a president, a C-level a um, employee is coming down talking to us in an open forum that's not so you know, strict, are, are stringent with the rules, it feels, you know, it feels better. It, it makes you feel more comfortable. You, you will get more information that way. And it, 
helps the employees feel like, okay, they're being transparent. He's telling us exactly what's going on. And the town hall meetings can be used, especially um, in good times, but also in bad times, to build team spirit in a sense that we're all in it together. So when you're talking about your culture and you want to find out about your culture, it's really hard to do if you're just sitting in your office with the door closed. So having a, ta a town hall meeting can definitely help you in regards to finding out what the culture is and what the culture should be and what your people would, would like um, and what type of culture your people would like to work in. And then also the last uh, one that we have and how to kind of take a survey of the culture, or I like to call maybe a culture audit, an audit, is having coffee conversations. They're more private. And for some, this is a safer environment. While that town hall is great, while the employee survey is great, sometimes people don't like putting it on paper because they feel like, yes, you said it's anonymous, but it's not really anonymous. You're going to know that I said that I don't like this. The town hall meeting, sometimes people feel too many people around and they want to kind of withdraw from that. So having the third option, a coffee conversation, that one-on-one, -on -one is it can make some people feel um, safer, which means that they will open up more. Now there's drawbacks. Once again, you know, I like to talk about the pluses, but we also need to know about the drawbacks and the challenges because, once again, knowing that type of information is essential in regards to helping you be a proactive problem solver. So the drawbacks for any of these methods are when you do these, expectations are then created from the survey, from the town hall to the coffee conversations. And they can become major problems if they remain unfulfilled after we've completed these three things. So if, if an issue has arised, and you know, if it came up during one of these sessions and you know, six months later, we still have the same problem, then people aren't going to have value in the surveys. They're not going to have value in the culture because you're not meaning what you're saying. And so I can't trust it. So the best practices in regards to kind of help with that is make a carefully worded, realistic, make sure it's realistic, commitment to address the survey results. Don't, you know, promise to solve every problem that surfaces because there's no way. There could be something that, you know, we just can't do. I want to have more parking spaces in the parking lot. Well, you know, we can't redo the lines. You know, the spaces are the spaces. So don't say that you can make sure everything is going to happen, but do promise to make a good faith effort to improve circumstances on base, based on what you learn. Maybe in regards to that parking lot situation, we can have employee of the month so they get a premium parking space. So, you know, if parking is a big issue, well, then let's set aside some areas or, or, or some spaces for, for the people that are, you know, speaking to our values, are working towards our values. You want to uh, excuse me, you want to publish complete survey results and hide nothing. Transparency is the key. You want to make sure that, you know, people aren't thinking that you are not trying to tell them everything. With Zappos, what they did was they send out every, I think it's every quarter, they send out their customer serve, or excuse me, their employee survey reviews for everyone to see because they also ask, you know, what do you think of our culture this quarter? What do you think we can do to improve? And, you know, it's just, you know, give me a couple of sentences or, or, or a phrase. And then they publish that for everyone to see, the good, the bad, the ugly. And that's what, uh, you know, that, that's what transparency is. And then you want to honor the commitment to make the good faith effort towards the improvement. If you say you're going to do it, do it. You know, like I always say, action speaks louder than words. That's what my mom and dad always told me, and that is so true in business as well. If, if you're saying one thing and doing another, if you say our culture is, um, you know, customer service friendly, but then every time I come to you with a customer service, you say, no, that doesn't fit into our bottom line. Your actions aren't matching the words. So you want to make sure that they do. And now when we talk about action matching the words, that, go, that takes us to having a winning culture. And a winning culture starts with, you know, 
core values. You have to make sure that you, that you have your core values. And then it goes into attitude of gratitude, communication, continuing education, and perception. And we're going to talk about each of those. Most companies create culture without clear direction. When there's no clear direction, culture begins to get lost in policy and procedure. So let's talk about core values. And let's talk about how do we create this. Regardless of the size or structure of your organization, your people look to leadership as an example of how to behave. This makes it so vital that leadership actually sits down and defines what the core values are. We're looking to our leadership to kind of tell us what we're supposed to do. So leadership better know exactly what they're doing. And you know, the framework when we're thinking about developing core values for your organization is as follows. Get people's personal values. You want to, you know, send out an a, a survey, send out an email. You know, Zappos sends out an email to to their employees a few years back asking them what uh, what values are significant and meaningful to them. You know, they said just give us a, a few words, a statement, a sentence, and it doesn't necessarily have to do anything with the company value. You know, it could be what we want to know what you personally value because if you get what they personally value, you can incorporate that to your core values. Now you're mess, you know, now you're bringing in someone's passion. And if you have their passion, if you have their heart, you have someone that's going to stay with you. The step 2 in regards to creating those core values is once you have that information, you want to combine them. Pick out the commonalities. Also, look at your star performance. If you have a star performer on your team and, or, excuse me, in your office and they exemplify exactly what you're looking for, pull out what they, you know, what are their values and then maybe that's what we need to strive for. Send, then you want to send it out to the entire company and ask for feedback. Say, this is what we've come up with. Do you all feel like the, these are our core values? And next, and excuse me, next you want to test your commitment. Think about this. Look at those core values. And now think about this. Are you willing to hire and fire people based on whether or not they fit those values? Even if an employee adds a lot of value in other areas in the short term, are you willing to let them go because they don't match your core values? That really speaks to dedication. And it also speaks to how much you value those core values. And lastly, you want to roll it out. And you want to roll out the values to the entire company. Let everyone hear that this is this is what we're about. And then not only let them hear it, you also want to let them see it. You want to integrate the core values into everything that you do, especially hiring, firing, and performance reviews. The next piece that we talked about in regards to creating that winning culture is attitude of gratitude. When you're thinking about the attitude of gratitude, you want to use your key values to guide decisions and set clear expectations. So we know what our core values are. And now you want to recognize employees that exemplify those core values. Um, I worked for a company about 10 years ago where we would um, we had halls of fame for the employees that buy, that embodied each value. Like each hall had a different core value on it, and the employees that uh, exemplify that their names would go on that hall. So that would be like the Tanya Devane Hall for integrity, or the Kim Hall for. Um, uh, excuse me, for engagement, or it could be, you know, the Cindy Hall for detail orientation, you know, quality. So having those different, so that not only reinforced what our values were, it also showed other people, yep, Cindy does have great quality. Her, her work is always high quality. Kim is always engaged and motivating. And so now they, they have something real that they can pull from and say, OK, that's what that value looks like in the real world. And so that you know, and kept it on your mind. So when you're thinking about attitudes of gratitude, you also want to consider all parties. 
in regards to recognition. Not all recognition is equal. You want to strive to under, understand the individual. Not everybody wants a big parade down Main Street because, you know, they, they sent a fax out to a client. Yes, people still do fax. <laughs> we get them all the time here at the Omnia Group. But some people do want the big parades. So understanding who you have on your team, who, who, who you have in your company is very beneficial, especially when we're doing attitudes of gratitude, because isn't it the worst to get something and, and not feel very, not, not feel good about it? You know, like, well, this wasn't really motivating. I mean, I, I, th I thank you for it, but this isn't necessarily how, um, I, how I would like to be motivated. Doing those surveys can help in regards to this attitude of gratitude. Secondly, you want to make sure that it's meaningful. Praise and plaques and coffee mugs, believe me, they're great, but they come in infinite supply. If you want to truly reward someone, do it with, um, do it with limited resources such as cash or a nicer office or extra time off or lunch with the CEO or a personalized note, something that takes a little bit more a time, something that's not just, you know, oh, go in the magazine and grab you something. You know, I know I, I worked for a company before where for the recognition they would hand out the magazine and say, oh, go pick you something out. Well, I mean, okay, that's nice. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed picking out my iPod, and, and that was a nice gift, but it could have been, you know, a little more in regards to how they, how they presented it. So, you know, having a special note, or maybe when the iPod came that it, you know, it was presented in a way that it just, it just didn't come to my house and like, oh, I got the iPod. You know, let's talk about why did I get the iPod? What did I do great? And have that sp special uh, type of connection. And I know people are like, what? She's complaining about the iPod. That's why we can't do recognition. I enjoyed the iPod. Believe me, I'm not complaining about the iPod. But adding a special recognition, so tying that back to the core values, having someone recognize it, um, you know, in in regards to the core values would have been even that more motivating. So you know we talk about good, better, best. They did a good job, but we always have room for improvement. Be consistent. You you know, meaning you don't just want to arbitrarily stop and start the recognition. You know, I've had a company I worked for where all of a sudden, oh, we're getting recognized for this. Okay, I didn't know, like they didn't send out a communication, but all of a sudden, here you go. Or they'll just stop it all of a sudden. Well, we used to get it every year. Every year we'd get a bonus, but not this year. But no one told us that we weren't getting a bonus. Yes, now true. A bonus is something added extra. But once you start doing something, continue, you know, for two or three years, and then all of a sudden you stop, people kind of rely on that. So consistency is the key. And then don't be stingy. Research shows that most managers give employees far too little recognition. And, and recognition meaning saying, hey, you did a great job. I know when I'm counseling my clients here with the Omnia Group, especially my leaders, I, I talk about, you know, maybe every day put four pennies on your desk. And then by the end of the day, the four pennies should be inside of your desk because you need to congratulate at least four people a day. And I'm not saying just, you know, oh, great, Cindy, you went and, you know, you, you sent that fax off, but make sure it's genuine because that's also something that will not help in the attitude of gratitude is when they feel like it's insincere. So look around, see what people are doing great, look at your core values and see how they're matching those and reward people for that because you've, you've done a lot of work to come up with these core values. This is your brand and if that brand and if you want to perpetuate that brand, you need to reward people for doing things that, that your brand says it's going to do. So when you have attitude of gratitude, employee satisf satisfaction, excuse me, goes beyond compensation. You may already have, you know, some of us, you know, you all probably already have some type of recognition 
process in place. But like I said, there's good, better, best, and there's always room for improvement. So let's talk about communication. That's the next piece. You want to have, you know, you want to understand modes of addressing the communication. So when we're talking about having that winning culture, we want to talk about the mode of how to address it. Some people are great with a face-to-face. -face. Other people enjoy an email. You want to make sure that it's timely. If I did something six months ago and you reward me, you know, now, it's, I, I'm not going to tie it back to what you want to tie it back to. So make sure it's timely. Also, communication means feedback. It's a give and take. You know, tell me what I'm doing right. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. And then have a receptive atmosphere, meaning if you have an open door policy, have an open door policy. I, you know, I've... I've heard of places where, you know, yes, the door is open, but we all knew that we should not come in. <laughs> you know, it's that while it was open, it's definitely not that open. And then you want to have, you know, you want to make sure your body language is matching your words. Because we all know about communication that sometimes it's, it's more about what the person sees than what they're actually hearing. And then lastly, be open and honest. Transparency, again, is the key. When I was a manager, I would encourage my employees to tell me if they've been approached by a recruiter or offered a job. Because I know I used to try to poach people all the time when I got great customer service or when I had a great sales experience. So when they did do that, I would, you know, I would give them, I would bring in bagels for them because <laughs> it's kind of like, toasting them for the fact that our employees are being sought after, that they were assets. But I wasn't worried that they were going to leave me because they wanted to work for us. They wanted to work for me. And I had the highest retention rate among the other sales managers because I had that transparency. That's what transparency looks like. I don't want them to hide it from me. Let's talk about it. Let's be open and honest. The next piece of creating that winning culture is knowledge. You want to, you want to foster the circle of education. Whenever we uh, talk about employee and employee engagement and what gets them going. It's being this knowledge, meaning they want to have um, experiences where they uh, they want to have opportunities where they have uh, where they can learn more, where they can do some online training or get some industry knowledge or education. It's important to hire employees who are committed to expanding their industry knowledge and eager to learn. And a lot of a lot of employees are, but a lot of employers don't offer that opportunity. So think about knowledge is key. Now, when we're looking at, you know, when we're seeing this, go ahead and type in what's the first thing you see. A face, a face, yes, a person. Kim sees the person, you see the face, yes. And I do this exercise because perception, a creepy face, <laughs> yes. When, we, when, we're looking at, um, when we're looking at our culture, perception is the key. And what is perception? Perception is the way we think about or understand someone or something. What one perceives can be different from what others perceive and can be different than what the than what the reality is. So when we think about perception, you think about culture, it affects the attitude, it affects people's motives, it affects the interests, the experiences, and the expectations. What people perceive is usually what they believe, and that is based on what they hear, see, and think. So if you want, you know, so if we're in this creating a winning culture mode, we need to stay true to our core values. We need to celebrate those who demonstrate those values. And then we also want to keep the lines of communication open. That is how you create that winning culture. So now let's talk about we have that winning culture, but now let's talk about when we're going to go through some changes because, you know, the world changes, which which will change our business. When, when that happens, when major transitions happen, you want to communicate it. You want to be able to connect the dots. So it's basically helping the, helping the employees through it, meaning telling them the why behind the what. 
Once again, I can't say transparency enough. And you want to be that proactive problem solver. You see the changes are coming. So go ahead and proactively think about how I can solve that issue. So when your employees come to you, the solution is already there. And then give them a voice, because sometimes, because your employees are on the front line, they may have the solution for you. They know what's happening. And they may be able to give you that better, more cost-effective solution. You want to be upfront and honest, and you want to ensure that they have a voice and that they are being heard. That's how you can kind of go through the, the bad waters or, or the heavy waters of change. The next thing, now let's look at, is your culture healthy? So it is if, you have, if your retention rates are high, if you have better quality resumes and applicant pool, if you have a high accountability, meaning an accountability is not a bad word. It should not equate to a threat or punishment or harassment or embarrassment but rather it should be an understanding you know, between you and management about the expectations and whether or not we met those expectations. That's what accountability is. So a, a healthy culture does have accountability. They also have that work-life balance. They have, you know, and they welcome change. Change is a part of innovation. And then top talent wants to work for you. So you have that great um, big pool of applicants. And then last thing, leadership isn't restricted to a title. Just because, you know, I don't have leadership or manager in my, in my name doesn't mean that I can't help and lead. When I think about leadership, leadership is not an actual position or title, but it's an action. So think about the people that, are, that have a lot of action or are called to action in your organization. To get a clean bill of, uh, a bill of health, for your workplace culture, you need these things. And to figure out if you have them, you want to ask yourself, what, what's our focus? If you're not sure your culture is healthy, think about where your focus is. And can everyone explain it quickly? Like that first survey question, everyone should be like, yes, I can. Like all of my employees can. And then are people excited about joining your organization? And then think about the things that you want to stop and start. And when you have a healthy organization, what's uh, and, and it's driving uh, for success, this is what will happen. You'll have great financial benefits. Your recruiting will become easier because people want to work for you. The morale is higher, which means your customer service um, goes through the roof. And then employee motivation. So you have those employee engagement scores that are going up. You have a more um, innovative type of company that is more responsive to change. So if something happens in the organization, it doesn't fall to its knees. It's not broken because we're able to bend. You'll have more involvement. When you get more involvement, what you get is more ideas, things of how to make your company grow. And then lastly is that retention. You'll be able to retain that top talent because we all know hiring is not the best, you know, it's not the greatest part of anyone's job. So if we, if we don't have to do it often then and we're retaining that top talent, that's, that's perfect. Simply put, a healthy culture is truly a great place to work and it drives success. So when we think about these companies, I'm just going to bring over our last poll here. Tell me, what do you think, um, what does shoes, airplane, and a mouse have in common? And then the, the second poll is chase the vision, not the money. Do you agree or disagree? Okay, it looks like for the first poll, they all have culture in common, and then some people feel like it's all of the above. And for that one, what if I said, think more specifically about Zappos, JetBlue, and Disney? It's a universal and fundamental, a universal and fundamental theme emerges. It's actually all three. 
these companies are recognized for their culture, their customer service, and their high employee engagement scores. And the Zappo CEO is the one that actually said, chase the vision, not the money. Meaning that if you have those core values and you chase those core values, the money's going to come because everything is working now towards that vision, towards those core values. So yes, chase the money, not the, uh, excuse me, chase the vision, excuse me, not the money. And when we look at these companies here, all of these companies were named the top 25 most enjoyable companies to work for from Glassdoor back in 2014. Time and time again, the examples are based on culture. Rarely are they, oops, sorry, didn't pull them all up. Rarely are they based on salaries or benefits. I mean, yes, salaries are nice, benefits are nice, but a lot of these make that top 25 because of the culture. Now, are there any questions? You can go ahead and type the questions um, in at the bottom. The one question I get all the time when, when I talk about creating a winning, a winning culture is, what is the one thing I can do to start, uh, to start doing a great job with my culture? And the answer is balance. Find the right balance for your team, your company, in terms of transparency, openness, feedback, and policy. Once you do, your organization will become more productive, efficient, and successful. And all of that means adding to the bottom line and adding to your employees' work-life balance, adding to their um, in enjoyment in so they don't get the Monday blues every single day. Here at the Omnia Group, we offer um, a cultural survey that we can build for your company. And, you know, what you can do is contact Kim, and she can assist you with that. Because culture is so important, it breeds everything else. If you have a strong culture, you will have a more successful outcome in regards to hiring because people will want to come work for you, so it will be easier in regards to your clients and customers. People will want to buy from you because they, because they can feel that culture. They can feel the happiness of the employees. So understanding what your culture is is the secret ingredient to having a successful and winning uh, type of corporation. So in closing, I have put up the information. One, you can register for our upcoming webinars. Also, the takeaways is our cultural survey and then that uh, Omnia cultural survey information, if you're interested. Also, the PowerPoint slides uh, that about, excuse me, for this presentation. I want to thank everyone for joining me today. It doesn't appear that we have any questions, but please feel free to contact Please feel free to contact um, me at the, you know, my contact information is up there and we will, and I will be able to assist you and get those questions and get any questions answered for you. Our next uh, webinar is going to be employee recruiting methods to hire right the first time and that's on April 7th. Even though it says, um, I'm sorry, it does say April 7th, 12.30 to 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. Again, thank you all for joining, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.